Ray Dalio is one of the most successful investment managers in history. He's built a firm, Bridgewater, that is the largest hedge fund by multiples. Most successful, he has now written a book called Principles, in which he's kind enough to tell us how he did it and how we can do it. Ray, thank you so much for joining us. It's thrilled to be here. So here's your book. Congratulations. I know in firsthand how hard it is to write a book, and this is a particularly long and pithy one. So congratulations. Nice. Um, so let's start right in the beginning. The first sentence. You say, I want to establish that I am a, quote, dumb sh who does not know everything he should know. What do you mean by that? It's a very charming and disarming start, but what are we supposed to take away? Well, I, I think it's important. I know that uh, the key to my success has not been so much what I know as much as how I deal with my not knowing. I mean, that's basically a big theme of the book. How do you have an idea meritocracy? There are only two things that you need to do in order to be successful. The first is you have to know what the right decisions to make are, and then you have to have the courage to make them. And most people don't have in their heads the right decision. And I think one of the greatest tragedies of man is that they hold on to opinions in their heads that are wrong, and they don't go out there and stress test them. So we have an idea of meritocracy. I mean, there's a reason I wrote this book before I wrote Economic and Investment Principles, because that's really more sort of my skill set. Um, but in building an organization and are dealing with the markets, to be able to have independent thinking and go beyond what you all individually know, know in order to get the best is the key to success. And you share in detail your own development of coming to developing these principles. One of the events that you share would have been wildly traumatic for most people is that you talk about being fired from Shearson for punching your boss in the face. What happened there? Well, that was just, uh, you know, I, I was kind of wild then, and it was New Year's Eve, and I got drunk, and he got drunk, and, you know, we did that. Um, and and I, I punched him. I didn't get fired for that. He was a good guy. We came in on, uh, you know, the following Monday morning, and uh, he said, okay, we'll get it past us. I got fired for doing something else not far after. Okay. But I was a, kind of a rebellious. The, the thing that affected me the most, I would say, was uh, being so wrong in 1982 on the bottom of the stock market. In other words, I, I had anticipated that there would be a debt crisis with Mexico, and in August, Mexico defaulted on its debt, and I thought we were going to have an economic crisis because there would be this worldwide debt crisis, which occurred. Right, and, and our Mexican just, just to set the scene, this was, you had left Shearson, you had started Bridgewater, you'd had many years of being very successful, you'd gotten very confident, and you'd made this huge controversial bet that we were headed into a next Great Depression, and then... Right. The, de the defaults came. Mexico defaulted in August 1982. I thought, wow, we're going to go in this crisis, and everything's going to fall apart. And that was the exact bottom of the stock market. Like, I couldn't have been more wrong. And it was painfully wrong because I had built the company up until that point. We had, were a tight group of, small group of people. I had to let everybody grow. I was so broke, I had to borrow $4,000 from my dad. I had testified to Congress because they asked me to explain this. I had been on Wall Street Week, all of those mistakes. And it was a very painful experience. And it turned out to be probably the best experience of my life because it changed my attitude about thinking. I, in other words, th rather than thinking I'm right, I went to thinking, how do I know I'm right? Um, and it created this open-mindedness. To be able to then go find the smartest people who disagreed with me and to see how they would think about things, to balance my bets better. It taught me uh, a radical open-mindedness. It taught me what you're referring to in the beginning of the book that I'm trying to convey, that the power of radical open-mindedness and an idea meritocracy is such a powerful thing. And you talk a lot about how this process of pain, and I can imagine that was just, a, again, a gut-wrenching experience of have to fire all of your friends, you have to rebuild from zero, you start going forward, you have to look in the mirror and say, hey, I was way too arrogant and confident. I have to effectively relearn. That's not an easy thing to do. Right. I have a, a saying, pain plus reflection equals progress, right? And I d began to develop this knee-jerk reaction. If I'm, it, pain is a signal that something is wrong, that you did something wrong if you make those mistakes. And then to take that pain and to calm oneself down and think, what would I have done differently in the future? So my instincts change. I view those experiences now like solving puzzles that'll give me gems. The puzzle is, 
what would I do differently in the future so I would get a better result? The gem is the principle that I would write down as I learned it. So literally, by writing down the principle, when this one comes along, what do I do with it? There, everything is another one of those. Like, we have a million of those. Yes. And if you start to say, when one of those comes along, how should I best deal with it? And you write down that recipe. Those are the principles. So I found that exercise to be great. And I also found that I could turn those principles into algorithms. So let's say our investment process. Those criteria are built into literally algorithms and data can come in. So I found that process of encountering pain to produce reflection, to produce better ways of doing it, to pr principles, and then carrying that forward to the decision making has been invaluable. And to do that with people who are going to disagree with me and to know how to do that well. That's been the key to success. And one of the first and most important principles that you outline is embrace the truth, whatever it happens to be. Right, and a reality. One of the very striking moments in the book is when you talk about how your top managers, after you rebuilt Bridgewater into a success again, basically came to you and said, look, here's what Ray does well. He's a genius money manager and thinker and so forth, but here's what Ray doesn't do well, and I have to read this because for anybody leading other people, just a very startling quote, it says, quote, Ray sometimes says or does things to employees that make them feel incompetent, unnecessary, humiliated, overwhelmed, belittled, oppressed, or otherwise bad. And you say very candidly, your first reaction was, ugh. Like, I don't want to do that. These are people I work with. I don't want to have those cons. And on the other hand, it's this radical straightforwardness. Um, and I want them to speak to me in a straightforward way. So we were at a moment, uh, that's, a, that's a painful moment, and then it's a moment of reflection. Should I not be as straightforward? Should they not be? What could I do differently? So what we decided to do was deal with it together. Like I thought that I should then ask the questions. Do you not want me to tell you what I think? Do you? I would appreciate you doing the same with me in that straightforward. So how should we be with each other? And by agreeing how we should be with each other and writing those things down so that we, this is what we're doing, we began to get more of the management principles of how we are with each other because it's the key to the, our success. But, but it can be painful. It can be un not understood well. There's things in our brain, neuroscientists tell me that there's a part of our brain which we call the prefrontal cortex, the thoughtful part of our brain, in which we sort of want to be radically straightforward. We'd like to know what our weaknesses is, because it's logical. And then there's an emotional part of the brain. We understand the amygdala, that is the fight or flight, and it takes disagreement and it converts that into a battle, and it's not easy. And so those two parts of our brains are at odds, and if we understand that and we work ourselves through, at the end of the day, can I be radically truthful with you? Like, what's so bad about us being radically truthful with each other and radically transparent? I want to say one more thing so you understand Bridgewater. Okay, Bridgewater is an idea meritocracy in which the goal is to have meaningful work and meaningful relationships. They're equally important but to do those through radical truthfulness and radical transparency. So you're on a mission together, the meaningful work, but you're, um, and you have these relationships in which you care. If you have those relationships and you can understand that there's caring, what well, is the same time as that there's holding each other to high standards, if there's tough love, that that's a very powerful force. And by being radically truthful and not political, and being radically transparent, we've been able to do that. So that's the secret sauce. In other words, it's explained more comprehensively there. But the results speak for themselves. And you talk about the two parts of the brain, the logical part, the emotions. A lot of the book sounds like the process you've created is to take the emotion out of everything, turn the business into a machine, make all decisions, use computers to aid decision making. Is there any part where emotion helps? Well, emotion what is, about passion? I, I think emotion is the most important thing. So let me distinguish between two things. There's, there's, a, there's emotion that's beneficial to you and there's emotion that's detrimental to you. If your emotion is going to cause you to do something that you regret later, that's, that's a problem. 
if the motion is, helps you do the things that you want, so I think the most important things are emotion. The emotion of inspiration, the emotion of love, the, these are things, what, that's what I'm working for. But to the, the emotions that we don't want to have is those that we regret afterwards. So the notion here is um, to deal with emotion and not just to take it out, but to put it in its right place. So for example, if somebody's having an emotional moment in a conflict, then you, you say, how should we best handle that? Do we put it aside and we'll deal with it a little bit later? Do we have somebody help us through our conversation? Do we communicate by another vehicle, email, so that it can be logical and seem less emotion? The important thing is, in order to have an idea meritocracy, you have to do three things. First, you have to put your honest thoughts on the table for everybody to see. So if everybody could put their honest thoughts on the table for everybody to see, that's a great thing. A lot of people have problems doing that, but that's the Difficult, beginning. Difficult, scary. But, but not if it's the, you got to do it, otherwise it's all the scenarios going on in your mind that might be wrong and it's not honest. So what should be the problem? There should be no problem. You should feel good. Put it on the table. Let's look at it. Let's do it well. The second step that you need to do is to have thoughtful disagreement. In other words, to know how to disagree well, to take in information and, and pass it through and to think things through. So we have protocols for doing that. So that, that we have a two minute rule and things that I could describe or are described in the book that allow at that protocol to have a quality exchange so that you together can get, all of you, to a better place than you could individually. That's the power, right? And then you have a process that if you have an, a disagreement that remains, how do you get past that disagreement? And so you have to have a way. Um, ours is what we call believability-weighted decision-making. You know, the, and, and I could explain this if, if you want me to, but in any relationship, you need to have those things. Can you speak honestly with each other? Do you have good ways of working through disagreement in a productive way? And do you have ways of getting past your disagreement? That's true for any relationship, right? And one of the other principles that you stress is this idea that you should teach your team to fish rather than giving them fish, but you gotta give them room to make mistakes. This is something that Jeff Bezos and many other incredibly innovative entrepreneurs have stressed again and again, we have to get over the failure, the fear of mistakes. This seems to be a key part. Well, you learn from saying. mistakes and you learn from pain. Like I say, you know, you can scratch the car, but you can't total the car. Okay, you, mistakes is one of the base, best sources of learning, right? Successes mean you do the same thing over again, and okay, that's fine. But uh, mistakes that are painful stick. When I look back on my career, I think that the mistakes were the best things that happened to me. I remember my mistakes better than my successes. Somehow there must have been more of the successes to get me where I am, but I remember all the mistakes, and I remember the lessons. So that's what I mean by pain plus reflection equals progress. So yeah, it's okay for you to um, make mistakes. It's not okay for you to not learn from those mistakes. That's a principle in there, right? And so you have a culture that operates this way. If you don't have a culture that operates this way, it's not gonna be self-reinforcing. And so the reason I'm talking about um, these types of principles rather than my economic and investment principles, which will come out in the next book, is because these are the most fundamental principles which are the basis of success. And they're not just an investment, it's how investment firms' principles, it's not just a hedge fund's principles, it's like our principles of how we're gonna deal effectively with each other. Let's talk a little bit about investing. One of the things that, as I've learned more about Bridgewater, that I hear again and again is you have the radical transparency in the culture and among employees, but your actual investment book and decisions are kept to a very small group. Is that for competitive reasons? Why do you do that? Well, uh, yeah, uh, proprietary reasons on anything like the particular algorithms, the trades that we're doing, it would disadvantageous our clients if we were to, you know, make that all public. But the concepts, um, our economic and investment concepts, I'm happy to share. I did this 30-minute video mm -hmm. that uh, basically how the economic machine works, and in 30 minutes I told the most important things that I know about the economy because I want to pass that along. I want to pass along things that are going to be helpful to people. I'm at a stage in my life where now my primary goal isn't to be more successful. My primary goal is to help other people be successful. When I first did this, I thought this was presumptuous. It's, it's in, in, in 2008, we anticipated the financial crisis and did well. We received a lot of attention, and then there were stories about what 
this environment is, is like that were not accurate. And I tried to stay below the radar, not, no media. And then um, uh, I was suggested I put the principles online. They were downloaded over three million times, and I received a lot of thank you notes and so on. Well, at this time, I think that uh, I sort of have a responsibility to pass along the things that I uh, think are va valuable along those lines. And I hope that it will encourage other people to do it. When I think about the, if I think about J Jeff Bezos, Jeff Bezos is a man who made, uh, has formulas for successes. He's got re recipes. I think of principles are recipes for success. So wouldn't it be great if Jeff Bezos had a book of recipes and that you say, when you encounter that thing, what do you do when you encounter that thing? And, if I'm, and I hope to encourage, there, in fact, I am encouraging a number of people, I won't mention their names, but they're you know, kind of luminaries, fabulously successful people, will be giving me principles and writing principles. And I think if we look at those principles, so when we encounter another one of those things, we have principles to go to. I think it would be good for you to write your principles uh, <laughs> and each person to write their principles and also to walk the talk. So that way you know what you stand, others know what you stand for and are you operating that way. I think at this time it's important to be principled. I think our country needs to restate, you know, what are the principles that bind us together? What are the ones that divide us? How should we be with each other? Can we have idea meritocratic decision making? Can we deal with who knows who's right and how do you work those through? So this is something that's much more pervasive and I think very important. Well, I think on behalf of everybody who reads your book, it's been very valuable. I've learned a lot from you, from Jeff Bezos, Steve Jobs, and others. There's so much to soak up from that, so it's, it's great. On investing, you've recently written that risks are rising because of the political atmosphere. You've talked about how it looks a lot like 1937. That sounds very scary. What do you mean by that? Well, let me, let, let, let me clear up on this. This is not like 2007-8. When we, in 2007-8, we could do the calculations of how much debt had to be paid by whom, and we could see that that wasn't going to happen and that we were going to have a financial bust and, and, and that. By and large, economically, we are at the part of the cycle uh, that is not uh, too hot and not too cold, and assets have the right risk premiums and so on, so it's a relatively stable kind of environment. Um, on the other hand, it's very much like the 30s in that uh, in 1929-32, like 2008, we had a, um, a uh, debt crisis, took your interest rates to zero both of those times. Um, when interest rates hit zero, you don't have the same kind of monetary policy, so they print money, they buy financial assets. In both cases, they did. That caused an economic rebound in both of those cases. And it caused the stock market to rise a lot in those particular cases. And at the same time, it did not resolve the wealth differences. So that today, uh, the top one-tenth of one percent of the population has a net worth that is equal to the bottom 90 percent combined. Okay, The wealth gap is the largest wealth gap that there has been since the 1935 to uh, 40 period. And so while we have good conditions here, for the bottom 60 percent of the population, we have bad conditions. So the average averages don't convey what the picture is this, because of this disparity. And so what was tapped into and what we see is there's a large percentage of the population who is, is it a, who is hurting and that there is a conflict between uh, the haves and the have-nots and, um, and liberal ideas and conservative ideas and all of that. And we are having a greater polarity. In the 30s, we had populism. In other words, the, the selection of leaders who were strong leaders in a battle of one segment against the other segment and or inclined to fight for certain things. And so as we come into this period, it's somewhat similar to that. We will have, as we go forward, obligations. Demographics is going to affect our obligations. We're right now at the point where pension obligations, not only debt obligations, pension obligations, um, health care obligations, all of those are going to gradually sort of squeeze us and we have that division. And so it's very similar to that, and we're also at a point where 1937 was when the Fed said and that we could tighten monetary policy, and they put a slight tightness in monetary policy. In my opinion, the risks are asymmetric on the downside. Uh, in other words, uh, if you tighten monetary policy, 
um, certainly by more than is discounted in the market, and what's discounted in the market is a very minor rise in market, that that will reverberate through asset class prices, as well as then you could have a, a, a situation in terms of the economy. So it's similar in that interest rates are close to zero, not much room on the downside, obligations are large, there is a political division, there is more populism, therefore there's more conflict, and therefore we need to be very careful at this moment. That's what I'm basically saying. And you have spent more than 45 years betting on the future. Given that picture you just painted, what is your bet for the future? Well, I think we're, we're in the process of watching how uh, conflict is going to be handled politically. And that's being uh, reflected uh, not only internationally with um, something like Korea or Iran or, and so on, but we're also dealing with um, conflict uh, on taxes and so on. Um, I think that one of the things that uh, Donald Trump did extremely well was to identify uh, a constituency that was not heard and that um, he, he did that as a, a, a pro-business person. Um, in other words, somebody who is going to be businesslike and, and create that environment. That group could have been tapped into also by more of a socialist and what we have is a capitalist who is doing that. But in any case, whether socialists and capitalists working together to focus on, on, on that, I think that issue has been raised. And now uh, we, we deal with the issue. We're going to find out. The question is really, um, is Donald Trump, um, he's going to be aggressive. Is he aggressive and thoughtful? Or is he aggressive and reckless? And when we work through these, these situations, we're going to find out more and more. I think the fact that he's working across the lines personally, I like the negotiations with the um, Democratic side. And, I think a lot know, of Americans do. And so on. And to see that, you know, cut that deal in a way, if we can, to also deal with the whole of the economy uh, is something that I'm all in favor for. So we're in the process of finding this out, right? You recommend that most portfolios should contain some gold. Why? Yeah, of course. Why? That a lot of people think it's not, of course. In fact, it doesn't make sense. Well, first Why? of all, to structure a portfolio, the best way to structure a portfolio is, is to have the right kind of balance in your portfolio. So, and some amount of gold. Gold serves a purpose. It is, first of all, a diversifier um, against other assets. Um, you know, we have this risk on, risk off thing. We have, um, we also have a monetary system. Uh, we have a, the Brenton Woods monetary system began after World War II, and it had the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Um, there's a risk there. There's a, a, a lot of dollar-denominated debt and so on. If somebody did, felt that they didn't want to hold that and so on, you could have exposures to that. So it's a diversifying asset in, uh, that is sensible, and, and you know that's the main reason to have gold in the portfolio, five to ten percent. People, I don't understand it. People will have more in uh, terms of cash, or they'll have one. The key into in terms of being able to have a successful portfolio um, as a, as your core uh, portfolio. In other words, what's your strategic asset allocation mix? What is your if you're let me. Let me I got it. Let me ask you about Bitcoin. Okay. Bitcoin, people say the same thing. It's a store of value. You've got to have it diversified. The dollar's not safe. It's been going up and up and up, yet recently it crashed. Jamie Dimon came out and said it's complete fraud. He'd fire anybody at J.P. Morgan who invested in it because he wouldn't want people that stupid working for him. What do you think? There are two purposes of a currency. Is it a medium of exchange? And is it a storehold of wealth? Those are the basic ingredients. Bitcoin is not an effective medium of exchange by and large. And, 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 and if I go, I have a Bitcoin, I want to go buy things. It's not easy to buy things with the Bitcoin. And in terms of a storehold of wealth, a storehold of wealth uh, more reflects, like gold more reflects the opposite of what money is doing, right? And so you look at it, it's a storehold of wealth. Bitcoin is a speculative, uh, it's a speculative bubble. Right? Its price is like a greater fool theory in terms of its price. If you say, what is its intrinsic value? If, if Bitcoin was made into a more effective medium of exchange and also uh, operated in terms of a storehold of wealth, not of the reflection of that volatility, it would be a 
a viable instrument. It is, to me, a vehicle for speculation that's attracting people in, and it has all the classic ingredients of a bubble, people leveraging themselves up, and it doesn't have the, uh, that same intrinsic value. Even the privacy value, okay, is suspe suspicious. In other words, it has a purpose to some extent. If you're living in a country and you don't know your currency, uh, it was whether it's going to be good or not, and you might hold, try to hold that. But that thing you're holding is running around like crazy for reasons that you don't understand. And then, it, so it's not going to be an effective storeholder well. And the privacy will be stress tested. In other words, governments are examining who is operating in their own clever ways of what that, and so you can't even assume that that's, so it's going to be a privacy vehicle. So I don't see the effectiveness of Bitcoin. I could see uh, cyber secure, uh, currencies and, and so on, uh, but cryptocurrencies, but this is not what we're having. It's, it's, you know, it's a possibility that I think is, has been captured as a speculative vehicle that's in the middle of a bubble. You said something else about investing that I think is very profound and simple that I think a lot of people don't understand, which is to be successful as an investor, you have to bet against the consensus and be right. First of all, why? Why can't we just buy well, stocks we think are Well, the, co the consensus is built into the price. So because the consensus is built to the price and assets price themselves in a way that they're all, they're all compete and they're all of equal value in certain sense. There's, there's risk premium of equities over cash and bonds will have a, that over whatever, but it's basically they're all priced that way. It's like, think of it as going to um, betting on a sports team, or in other words, you, or uh, uh, a, a horse racing. Okay, so there's handicapping that's going on. So in order to be successful, you're betting against the consensus and you have to be right. That's the, that's the game. And you described your first trade when you were a teenager, bought a stock, it tripled, you thought, hey, this is easy, but you convey very effectively that in fact it is extremely difficult, even though it seems so simple. Uh, being successful in the markets is more difficult than being successful in competing in the Olympics. Your odds are higher to be successful competing in the Olympics because you have more people trying to do it, you have more resources. We put hundreds of millions of dollars. We have at Bridgewater 1,500 people. We're now competing against other teams. And that's the kind of resources that are going into playing that particular game. So think about that in terms of handicapping it. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, what you can do is achieve balance. You can, you can, to know how to hold a balanced portfolio and to receive something that is a return that's much better than cash achieving balance is something that you can do. And, and I, I think that that, but it, figure, if you're going to enter the game, since value added is a zero sum game, you have to ask who are you playing against? What is this, who are you going in the poker game with? And you know, do you want to do that? And as you talk to people in the real world, is your sense that people understand what they're up against when they might buy a stock or try to time the um, market? Institutional investors um, who are smart, by and large, understand that. The average man tends to be much more reactive. If you look at the purchases and sales that they make, when something goes up, they're more likely to buy it. They think, ah, that's a good investment. They don't know how to measure that in terms of, oh, is that a much more expensive investment that's more likely to go down? So that's why you, know, you put ads in newspapers and they say, ah, that's what had that return, that's what they're attracted to. So they tend to buy high and sell low, and so they're not, the average man should not be playing this game in that way. They should be playing the game, uh, and, or humility. If you, if, you, if you think that you're good at playing the game, just make sure that it's like going to the poker table or going to the uh, racetrack. Do it with a little bit of money and watch it and get the best advice that you can to know that you're going to be able to take money out of the system rather than put it in. Ray, you've written a terrific book. Thank you so much for sharing your life and wisdom and, and best of luck. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it.